Our guest today is Cook County Assessor. He was born and raised in Hyde Park, where his parents lived for 40 years. He attended Kenwood Academy. He earned his undergraduate degree at Haverford College, just outside of Philadelphia, and he earned his MBA from Stanford. Our guest today and his wife, Rebecca, live in Oak Park with their three children who I'm, they're gonna watch this video, William 11, Rose 10, and Anna 8. And he is so smart that he brought his father with him today. Please give a City Club welcome to Walter Kage. Ladies and gentlemen, Fritz Kage. Fritz, you're on. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the warm welcome. Thanks for uh, uh, all of you taking the time to come here today. Jay and Ed, I really appreciate the, all the shout outs and the introductions. Um, I'm glad to be back here addressing the City Club. Nearly a year ago, in March of 2018, I had the honor of speaking at this forum for the first time about my vision for what the Cook County Assessor's Office could be. Now, let it be noted that the, there were considerably fewer people here back then. <laughs> I think this was immortalized in uh, one of A.D. Quigg's uh, Twitter, on her Twitter feed, but we couldn't find the picture this time. But that's okay, thanks everyone for coming. Um, much has changed since then, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to update you on, on all the immense progress that we've made, and on the challenges that we have ahead, because there are many of them. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my dad, Walter Kage, who has joined us. He's got a couple of different shout outs already. As some of you know, he's a Byzantinist. That means he taught Byzantine history at the University of Chicago, and he did that for 52 years. And so he has a special appreciation for the people and discussions that fill up the city club as a Byzantinist, and perhaps even some of the goings on in our own assessment system. Um, and Speaking of the U of C, I would like to acknowledge again one of its great graduates here, President Tony Preckwinkle. And uh, she's been a terrific partner in all the things that we're doing. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the Civic Consulting Alliance, which was instrumental in helping us with our transition. Its CEO, Brian Fabes, is here. And lastly, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the immortal, legendary investor and founder of the Acorn Fund, Ralph Wanger, who's there in the back. Uh, he's with us. He created the Acorn Fund in 1970 and made it one of the best performing mutual funds in the United States over several decades and managed it until 2003, a lot longer than I did. <laughs> and he taught me and other Acorn portfolio managers, some of whom are in the room, timeless lessons about valuation, but most of all about stewardship. So, you know, since winning the primary in March, I've worked with a team of top professionals and several of them have been hired onto my executive team. There are many of them here. I just want to point out one person. Uh, Don Meyer runs our valuation team and brings decades of banking experience, including most recently running lending for Byline Bank. Just raise your hand, Don. We didn't get to announce him in our original package of execs, so I thought I'd call him out. And on our team here today, just to run through quickly, we have a highly experienced legal authority on the property tax code, a senior data scientist and published expert on inequities in the Cook County assessment system. Uh, we brought in a manager from a successful assessment system in another state, Indiana. And we brought in experts on geographic information systems, which are at the forefront of technological leaps in this field. You know, Ralph Wanger, he taught us that you want to be downstream of technology uh, when you invest in companies, own the companies that are beneficiaries of good technology. Well, we're an office that's at the forefront of a lot of these technological changes, and bringing in experts and things like geographic information systems is really important. And not only that, we've recruited recognized leaders in county and city government with track records of achieving reform and restructuring major offices. Um, they're all here with me today. They're rarely called upon to stand in front of groups like this, but I just hope you'll join me in a round of applause for all of the great work that they're putting in. Great. 
Now, I mention all of this because I want you to have the confidence that I do. Yes, we face a set of complex and difficult tasks in reforming this office, but I'm convinced we have the right people with the right mix of skills necessary to get the job done and get us to where our peers are in the rest of this nation and to get this office to perform. We, I, I have that deep confidence in this team. And I just want to do a quick review of what we do at the assessor's office, because not, not a lot of people understand sometimes. It's very confusing. The assessor's office does not raise revenue or levy property taxes. Again, the assessor's office does not raise revenue or levy property taxes. So no matter what we do, the amount of property taxes collected does not change. The levy, which is $14 billion, is determined by our taxing bodies. But what we're about, what our job, is about dividing that levy amongst us. How do we divide the levy, that $14 billion levy, amongst us all? Um, and the law commands us to do it proportionally, according to the market prices for each property. That is the law. And we need to use all of the best data and model models available to do that, so that we're not preferring one group over another. This process needs to be done fairly and transparently. And last year, voters felt it wasn't being run that way. So on December 3rd, I took the oath of office and walked through the doors of the third floor of the county building, filled with optimism, but unsure of the challenges ahead. We came in with a plan. On day one, we put in our 100-day plan of objectives and initiatives on our website, and even provided a status update of unprecedented length uh, on the halfway mark for how we're doing. And some of these objectives were available to implement immediately through executive order. Some have taken a couple months to put into practice. Still others, like relaunching our website, which we know is long overdue, are just beginning and will take most of this year to finish. We've centered our plans on three key values, ethics, fairness, and transparency. On day one, we ended the employment of anyone who received his or her job due to political or family connections. But our commitment, thank you. But our commitment to ethics goes much deeper than that. On day one, I also signed an executive order broadening the ethics provisions of our office, including a ban on gifts, elimination of political activity on the assessor's behalf, and a strengthening of the rules around conflicts of interest. Uh, this is in addition to my promise that we made since the beginning of the campaign, I will not accept any donations from the property tax appeals industry. We've also committed to the full implementation of the office's employment plan in compliance with Shackman Oversight. Uh, in conjunction with them, we have moved mountains already and we have much more to go, but we really appreciate the work that we've done with them so far. We changed the approval process for something called Certificates of Correction and Assessor's Review. This is sort of gobbledygook. It really means you got multiple bites at the apple at our office to lower your assessment mm -hmm. if you had access. Well, what we've done is, is we've changed the approval process for all of this and eliminated the potential for favoritism and multiple bites at the apple from insiders. And we've also put into place a new set of rules for those who wish to do business with our office in order to ensure that appeals are heard in a uniform and transparent manner. And on the transparency front, it's been a, a, variety, a, a, a quite varied set of tasks from collaborating with other offices on our assessment and appeals calendar to the establishment of a public visitor's log that applies to meetings with any director level or person or above. We think everyone deserves to see who's visiting top management at the assessor's office. And we've also made our office more accessible and open by restarting the use of social media. And I know this sounds like a small thing, but it had been three years since our office had utilized Facebook and eight years since it had used Twitter. And to save people a phone call or a trip to the office, we now provide regular updates and customer service through these channels. And you can check our Twitter channel if you want to be entertained with how we're trying to deal with all of this. Um, and in addition, we're, we're uh, continuing to hold outreach and education events with people who have questions about exemptions and appeals. This continues. And since December, we've held more than 10 of these events. And starting in March, as new assessment notices are going out in the north suburbs, I'm going to be going out to our communities to answer questions 
uh, from taxpayers about our work. And as our office is making decisions, we owe it to property owners to hear directly from them about the impact of our policies. And as we've begun our efforts, we've gotten a better sense of how things work now and how they could work better. And fixing things is going to take years. It's going to take a few years. But I want you to know that wherever, whatever you might have heard about how this office is run in the past, you should believe in people who are there now. Uh, one of the first things my team and I did was to walk the floor introducing ourselves to the 235 people on our staff. Transitions are always uncertain, so we wanted to give people a sense of where we were headed, and we held town hall meetings outlining our vision and traveled to all of our branch offices and held one-on-one -on -one meetings with employees. My friends, I can't say enough about the intelligent, strong work ethic and sense of mission that I find the people working in our office. Some folks have worked there for 10, 20, or more years. And I was delighted to find that we have brilliant application developers, smart financial modelers, diligent researchers, and frontline employees who want to take a complicated system and make it better. And when I talk to people about what led them there and what keeps them there at our office, I hear the same thing over and over, that I just want to help people. And they all share our enthusiasm for the changes that we've talked about today. Unfortunately, folks haven't always been supported with the best tools for the job. We're primed for any number of digitally driven solutions. We're downstream of technology, but we're currently weighed down literally by boxes of paper. <laughs> In fact, you know, so here's a photo of our ninth floor where our valuation team sits. And that's one of the many walls of boxes we found when we took over the office. One set of boxes runs the full length of the Clark Street side of City Hall, a full city block from Randolph to Washington. And the floor, as you can see, has the look and feel of the final scenes of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, complete with <laughs> employees pushing carts of boxes into the darker recesses of the office. Sometimes you don't know whether to laugh or cry. And it's not safe to have this amount of paper in a place without sprinklers, I gotta say. Um, a more digitally driven mode of operation must be part of the assessor's office future. Without it, we won't be able to bring our assessment operations in line with industry best practices. And what people have a, expect in the rest of the United States, we should get here. And speaking of which, this month we've had the International Association of Assessing Officers, known as the IAAO, in the building. They're the global pros at this. As you might expect from the name, they're a ton of fun at parties. <laughs> Um, at our invitation, they've been conducting a thorough process audit of our office to identify both risks and opportunities and to ensure we adopt the best practices prevailing in the rest of our nation. Overall, the reception to our changes has been positive. Perhaps you saw this headline in Cranes that read, here's an exciting prospect, a boring assessor's office. <laughs> it's not exactly the way you might want to describe your work at cocktail parties or, or on your LinkedIn page, but I can understand why it's an attractive alternative based on the past. After all, I come from a long line of nerds, so I'm comfortable with this. Um, we get a lot of questions from homeowners to commercial lenders to journalists about what's happened before and about things you might have seen in the paper. And as for all those ninth floor boxes that provide the details of these stories, while well, some of you might know a bit about my history, we didn't talk about it earlier today, but I traveled to Russia right after college to study, and I studied the emergence of private companies and financial institutions there. This was in the 1990s. And in the post-Soviet era, Russia threw open its doors and allowed access to its archives for any and all who wanted to report on what was there and to find out the truth. Now, I'm not saying our office used to have a reputation for secrecy that rivaled the Kremlin, but I'm not not saying that. Um, and to that end, our office has pledged to maintain an open and forthright relationship with journalists in Chicagoland and all researchers, where in the past some documents might have been withheld in an effort to obscure our operations. We now look forward to your FOIA requests. We've have, we have hard work ahead of us, and I'm not going to lie to you. There's a temptation to turn around and blame the favoritism and nepotism of the past as the reason why it will fail, why it's going to take time to fix things. 
But that's not necessarily the concern of the owner of a modest home in Des Plaines who's wanting to hear how, their assessment, how our assessment models will help her. And it's not really on the mind of the homeowner in LaGrange who called our office a couple weeks ago to ask why his assessment went up and whether we think that's fair. And looking backward doesn't help the small homeowner in Dalton who feels the heat of competition from just over the border in Indiana and needs our office to understand the greater context of his business. No matter who's responsible for how we got here, I know taxpayers and property owners are expecting us to fix it. And I owe it to them to be honest about the situation as we found it, but I also owe it to them to provide good stewardship in turning things around. Systems and patterns have been in place for decades are going to require a mix of short and long-term solutions. The conventional wisdom seems to be that our honeymoon will end when the first set of new assessments are mailed out of our office, which just happens to be tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and starting with the township of Norwood Park. Uh, notices for the remaining townships in the northern part of Cook County will be sent out between now and the end of September about two townships per month. And the southern suburbs come in 2020, and Chicago itself in 2021. We're so confident in the fairness of the work, we're so confident in the fairness of the work that we're doing, we've committed to publishing the data and information they've developed about our assessments online, and down to the models and code that we use. This will help taxpayers understand their individual assessments, but also critically, how we look at data at certain classes of properties and within neighborhoods and communities. People need to have faith that not only their assessment is fair, but that everyone else's assessment is fair too. Because there is just one levy and it has to be distributed amongst us all proportionally and fairly. We'll have many tools and data sources to tell this story. We are going to be the first assessor's office anywhere to publish our code on GitHub which is a data hosting site used by computer programmers around the world, and they will be able to put in data in our models and replicate the valuations that we have on our site. We'll be one of the first to use TREP, one of the leading third-party data providers of data and analytics on commercial properties. And we'll show our work in R, which is a programming language and software platform that's becoming an industry publishing standard. And I wanna take a moment to thank the Cook County Board for their assistance in securing these vital technological tools to support our work, and it is all worth its weight in gold. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to be familiar with all these tools to follow our work. Uh, our communications and valuation teams will, be, will create easy to follow narratives about trends and market changes that guide our models and explain the commercial and residential pictures of all our townships. This office is going to go from being a laggard to a leader on data and transparency. And I hope you can see we haven't let any grass grow under our feet in the first couple of months. So I wanna take a moment now to tell you about one of the biggest challenges facing our office and our system as a whole, the need for better data. All the people and the changes that we've outlined above are gonna get us part of the way there to the standard that's achieved by our peers and the rest of the United States. But you could have the best models, data scientists, and algorithms in the world, but without good data, it's garbage in, garbage out. The only real way to solve this problem is to require income-producing properties to submit their operating income and expense data at the start of the assessment process. And for this, we need a legislative solution, specifically the passing of HB 2217. I want everyone in this room and all of our state legislators to know this. If lawmakers want to reform the property tax system, this is the place to start. HB 2217 would give the Cook County Assessor's Office and other Illinois counties that choose to opt in the ability to require owners of income earning properties to disclose basic rent, real estate income, and expense information. Those who, didn't, who don't comply would be subject to a fine, but many smaller properties are exempted, including those of owner-operators. The legislation also protects privacy by requiring that sensitive data is only published on an aggregated and anonymized basis. And here's a common reaction we often hear. You don't get this information already? 
This is what we hear from people in real estate, even property tax appeals law. Um, currently, income and expense information is required at the point of appeal. The Board of Review takes this data and uses it to determine a property's value one appeal at a time for those who appeal. But the assessor's office is in the business of mass appraisal. If we were equipped to require this data up front, at the start of the assessment process, we would be able to determine market level rents for every part of the county in a very precise, accurate, and uniform way. Many other places throughout the country already require this and therefore have accurate, predictable assessment systems. Georgia, Massachusetts, New York, Tennessee, Virginia, Washington, D.C., they all require this data. Not coincidentally, institutional real estate particip participants, of which many are in here right now, they tell us that these are the best assessment systems to emulate because the better data that comes with enactment of this legislation will be a critical element to de-risking our assessment system. Our assessment system today emits a whole level of risk, a whole level of uncertainty to every single participant in the real estate market that destroys value, whether you're a lender, a developer, an owner, or a market maker, or a service provider, and it especially affects communities where there is not good data. And so what I want you to know is that the availability of such data combined with the transparency of our valuation methods that we're committing to as the powers of our office will allow real estate market participants to have much greater clarity on how properties will be assessed. Developers will require less of a margin of error when deciding whether to invest so more projects can get started. Lenders could cut back on over escrowing and could lend more against the property's value. Potential buyers could have more confidence in the future path of assessments, and current owners could get more resale value for their buildings. Each one of these effects will enhance growth, value creation, and vitality in the Chicago area and lead to fairness and accuracy for everyone. There might have been a time when past practices here were tolerable, perhaps in the days when the real estate market was driven by local players and local developers raising local capital from local banks and investors operating in an environment isolated from other capital markets. Those days are rapidly receding, if not long gone. Real estate is a global asset class driven by institutional investors of all kinds and our local idiosyncrasies when it comes to real estate taxation are definitely not charming. <laughs> Market participants have told us that they want to compete on the basis of their innate competitive advantage as real estate operators, how they deliver services, how they execute, what their vision of the future is, what people like about their services, how they organize themselves financially, what they don't want to compete on is their idiosyncratic knowledge of our assessment system and access to preferential outcomes? Because the former, where you have these competitive advantages, that's portable around the United States and portable globally. It makes our real estate players more competitive internationally and nationally. If our real estate investors here succeed on the basis of access, they're stuck as local players because that is not portable. And Market participants have told us that that is why we should look to these other places to emulate. And while it's important to look at this within the context of global players, this matters for homeowners too, even more so in fact. Let's say you're assessing a few, sto a few storage facilities in a suburb, literally just a handful of them. These are commercial properties that aren't yet required to share income data with us. Without this data, our cap rates and now I'm getting into the weeds here, but the real estate people here will get this. The cap rates are basically how you multiply years of income to get the market price for it. Our cap, if our cap rates aren't accurate as they could be, even being off by just a couple percentage points, um, the, the, that facility could be dramatically underpaying its taxes. Maybe our models aren't built in the right way. And what ought to be a a tax bill of a couple million dollars for those properties ends up being around $600,000. This, this is a typical example. That reduction in assessment has to go up somewhere else. And more often than not, it gets made up by homeowners. Divide, say you're getting a group of properties off by one and a half million dollars. An error like that across a population of 20 to 30,000 people, 
you could have an expense that translates into a couple hundred dollars extra in someone's property tax bill. And we've seen evidence of this. $250 per year is no small amount of money to many homeowners. Keep in mind that anecdotal surveys tell us that a $500 unexpected expense is enough for many households to be tripped into insolvency. A mistake like that by our office, just because we don't have access to good data, puts the average homer, homeowner halfway to insolvency and halfway to bankruptcy. That is just one small case. And that's just one example involving only a few buildings in a single suburb. Inaccurate cap rates or models spread across an entire township or suburb or neighborhood can do profound damage to an economy or threaten the ability to feel secure, of people to feel secure in their homes. We can have the best data modelers in the world, but to create fair and accurate assessments, we need better sources of data. What keeps me up at night is the family in Norwood Park or Blue Island or Lawndale who needs this bill to pass to ensure that our work is as fair as possible. The good news is that we've received fantastic support for this bill. In the Senate, Revenue Chair Toy Hutchinson and Assistant Majority Leader Don Harmon are leading the effort. And in the House, we have a long list of sponsors, including our chief sponsor, Assistant Majority Leader Will Davis. And then we have co-sponsors, Revenue Chair Mike Zalewski, Assistant Majority Leaders Kelly Burke, and Fred Crespo. We also have broad support from school districts, banks, and institutional investors, unions, and community groups. And for those of you who are in here who like what you hear, we'd love it if you could slip for the bill, HB 2217. For a county the size of Cook, a paper-driven and ad hoc method of data collection goes against the efficiency taxpayers expect and deserve. With one straightforward law modernizing our assessment system, Springfield can decrease risk and costs to real estate participants while boosting transparency, creating valuable market data, and improving our state's climate and investment reputation. And I'll say it again here. If lawmakers want to reform the property tax system, this is the place to start. We believe that an ethical, fair, and transparent assessment system along with legislative reform will motivate investors to create jobs, grow our economy, and enhance Chicagoland on the world stage. You know, it breaks my heart every time The Economist magazine is telling foreign investors about the problems with our assessment system like they did two years ago or like they did with non-transparency here in Chicago just this last fall. Reforming this system will also create the kind of vibrant future for our local businesses that will reverse decades of economic hardships throughout the city and country, particularly in those communities which have struggled for far too long. We need this to be done fairly and uniformly. We're all in this together. Without these changes, we won't reform the economics of our communities, specifically how we fund the schools that prepare our children for the future and the municipal services that are such a vital part of our communities. And I know it's not sexy. No one's gonna write a page turner of a book about fixing cap rates. And it's hard to work in the phrase, equalize assessed value into a splashy headline. Believe me, we've tried. <laughs> but when we talk about becoming a world-class city, this is what's next, because it puts us on a par with our peers in states and cities that are growing, because we know tax policy impacts virtually every financial challenge that we face. At the end of the day, ensuring the ethics, fairness, and transparency of the assessor's office is about supporting the lives of the people of Cook County who invest in our area simply by living and working here. I'm so grateful to do this work on behalf of them, and I thank you for coming today. Shall we go to uh, Q&A here? Okay. Thank you, Fritz. Um, if any of you have any questions, just fill out those blue cards. Members of our staff will come around, pick them up. Um, we'll try to answer as many of these as is possible. You want to start with our guests from DuPage County and Naperville Township? Absolutely. I'm a okay. big fan. Okay. 
This is from Warren Dixon III, the assessor of Naperville. Now that you've had an opportunity to review the quality of parcel data, how bad is the problem? How will it impact the quality of your modeling now? And what new data collection procedures are you implementing to improve your data integrity? It is great to have a nerd like you, Warren, with us on this path. <laughs> um, so that, that gets right to the nub of the problem. We're bringing in state-of-the-art modeling. Uh, the county has engaged uh, providers of technology to give us good technological systems to handle it all. We need good data to come in to be able to do our job right and to not have bias and error. Um, we sort of put, put the data problem into two different buckets. For properties that earn rental income, we need to have good rental income data. And once we have that, this is how the market thinks about it. The market values properties like that basically on how, on their revenue earning potential and it compares it to interest rates and risks. And um, we don't need to have many transactions to be able to do that job well. You know, most of our peers in the rest of the United States get it within plus or minus 15% when they have that kind of information. We are well outside of those bounds at this office right now. We might be able to get halfway from where we are to that, but to get that final piece, we need that rental and income data. That's why we need this bill so desperately um, and why it's so important. It's especially important for the south suburbs, which we have coming up next year because a lot of those properties have a lot of vacancy. They have rents that are coming down in comparison with leases that they've signed, and we want to use only up-to-date rent information rather than looking in the rear view mirror, which is what we get when we use third party databases. So that's one piece. The bill will, will be the, the thing that solves that problem. Um, on the single family side, um, this is more of a grind because we need good building characteristics information. There are a couple different ways we can do that. We can use oblique imagery, um, like photography, that can get us some of that. Um, so that's a technological investment that probably gets us our best bang for the buck. We need partners who have uh, data about homes and we're trying to be creative about this. Fannie and Freddie Mac, uh, as part of their guarantees of mortgages, they have a, a uniform appraisal database that has good characteristics information. Now they've never shared it with an assessor's office before. We would love to work with them just to compare our information with theirs. Uh, even if it's only footage or quality, that's really all we need, some measure of quality. Um, the other thing we can do is we can invest in our field staff so we can go out and gather more information. We also want to collaborate with other county offices like the Recorder of Deeds um, and with the state Illinois Department of Revenue so that whenever there's an, it's a transaction, we can have some footage information that's up to date and um, quality information if there's some way to do that. That would basically solve our data problem on the single family residential side. But they're two different, two different kinds of problems. Thanks, Warren. OK, thank you, Warren. And if you need an expert, even though you know, there's conflicts of interest and no outside employment, <laughs> check with Fritz. OK. Uh, this is from City Club member Jim Harmoning. He's with Computer Bits, Inc. More important, his daughter recently passed the Illinois Bar Exam. She's a graduate of Loyola University. Congratulations to her and to the Harmonings. Question, in the short time you've been assessor, assessor rather, how has it been dealing with the township assessors? Are there any ideas you have to utilize them more or differently? Sure, um, so for those of you who don't know, township assessors uh, do not assess property in Cook County but they are ombudsmen for their community. So they can help people with problems uh, uh, who, who need exemptions or uh, problems if, there are, if they think they're not being assessed properly. They can also work with our field team and our data team to get better information about their communities to understand if anomalies are happening. And we want to work with the township assessors because they know their communities best. Uh, that will help us upgrade our data, improve our modeling, improve our field work in the past our office here downtown worked much more collateral, collaboratively with the township mm -hmm. assessors in working with our field team. We want to do more of that as we reinvest in field. Okay. 
By the way, a couple people submitted questions that are anonymous. We don't ask anonymous questions. If you don't have the courage to put your own name here while a public official is up here to respond, we don't honor those questions. Okay. This is from Dave Lundy with uh, Aileron. As you work to reduce inequities in the system, how badly will wealthier suburban areas be hit? You know where Dave lives. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the answer is we don't know because it's a very complicated, there are many different complicated forces at work. Um, uh, what, I'd, what I'd say is that, uh, you know, in some kinds of commercial property, we have different kinds of forces happening. In retail, the, no retailer in the United States, except for Amazon, is as strong as it was 10 years ago. Um, and we see in a lot of communities, um, all the way up to Water Tower itself, um, you see a lot of weakening economic performance, and investors see this too, and they require, they have to be compensated for the risk they're taking if they're buying an asset that's in decline. So that means, are we using the appropriate cap rates for these that are out, that could be out of date? So, um, you know, some of those, some of those properties could legitimately be over-assessed if we're driving through the rearview mirror like we do with old data now. Um, Interest rates have moved a lot, so we don't know, uh, you know, it's hard for us to know in advance before we get to assessing them. We're assessing communities township by township now. It's hard to know uh, what the magnitudes are if interest rates are out of date and how uh, other commercial properties have been assessed. And then single family homes, it's, it's, you know, housing prices have moved a lot in the last three years, but the, the, always the thing to remember is that in your community, Two-thirds of your property taxes go to your local schools, typically. And so uh, whatever is happening in your community with assessments moving around, it's typically uh, isolated what's happening in your community. It's not portable. Only about a sixth of, the, of what a typical suburban homeowner pays goes to the countywide portion of their bill. Most of it is um, uh, in their locality. So it's a complex question. We can't really answer, Dave, um, where it goes for a particular community, especially when you factor in factors like TIFFs and other things that can distort the outcomes. Okay. Thank you, Fritz. Hot lights up here, by the yeah, way. That's all right. Um, TIFFs and education. This is from Jeannie Ives. Jeannie, where are you? Thank you very much for asking this. Uh, what do you expect the TIFF surplus to grow to after reassessment? What do you expect the overall valuation to grow as a, present of, as a percent of current value? This is an important question as it relates to the school funding formula. Um, Jeannie, just for the reason in answer to the previous question, Dave, it's hard to say because it's a, it's a complex equation with feedback loops. So if we don't know the magnitudes of how much assessments are going up, in individual communities before we've gotten to them. It's even harder for us to calculate how much is isolated within a TIF versus in, else, in other areas. And by the way, we do not administer TIFs. It's just our job to assess the market value of properties. And that's hard enough as it is. That's our job. The TIFs are the creation of uh, municipalities or other bodies of government. Um, and so I, I, I honestly can't answer the question about uh, uh, what, hap what the implication is for the school funding formula. Um, I wish I could tell you more. We're basically, we're just trying to make sure that we're more accurate than we have been, and we will pr be providing you updates on how we're valuing individual communities so that you can try to anticipate how we value other communities that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and then with the data bill, uh, if it's passed, uh, looking forward a few years will be much easier to do because then everyone who has a question like yours uh, will be able to say, okay, here's the valuation models that they use, and then here's the data that they'll be plugging into those models, and so I can anticipate where the assessment will go. Right now, our systems are pretty antiquated. We run off of an old mainframe, and it's hard for us to do that kind of modeling. Thank you. Fritz, with regard to that House Bill 2217, um, have you heard from the uh, Governor Pritzker's office on this yet, or the uh, Republican leadership, as well as the Democratic leadership? We have met with all of those parties on HB 2217. We've had terrific discussions with all of them. I'd say 
you know, the specifics of those discussions are still to be deter are, are confidential, of course, but they've been extremely encouraging. And I just ask you, the proof will be in the pudding as we move uh, through the different houses and as you see people slipping for the bill. Um, I think, you know, our sponsors speak for themselves. Um, and if you listen carefully to, you know, what other folks are saying, um, it's been extremely encouraging. Okay. Um, you know, all politics is local. This is from Jean Marie Quigley, who's out there in Beverly. She runs the Beverly Bakery, Inc. Jean, where are you? Okay. Here's her question. There's a vacant school building that she would like to move her business into. Is it possible to get a pre-assessment to make the banks more comfortable with my projected numbers? Um, that is a, a good question. What we want to get to is to be able to say for in Beverly, to show you in Beverly um, what we're assessing per square foot of any kind of commercial space in Beverly for that appropriate class so that then you'd have a clear line of sight into that. It is hard for us to be able to do that now. We didn't assess Chicago last year. So the assessments that are in place for Chicago were done by the previous administration. We did not do them. Under the statute, we assess the north suburbs right now. We'll get to the south suburbs next year and then Chicago in 2021. But if you're moving into a new building and you want a pre-assessment, then we do assess that off cycle. And we, are gonna, we will come up with a transparent methodology. I'd ask you to talk to, uh, to contact our office to ask how we will be doing that because that's still a work in progress. We haven't done uh, new Chicago properties yet, but my vision is to say for any, you know, if you're looking in Beverly, what is the typical rent per square foot in Beverly? What's the typical cap rate for that kind of property in Beverly? What's the typical <laughs> expense ratio in Beverly? What's the typical occupancy in, in, Be in Beverly? And that will uh, tell you what the assessment will be. And we think that's the best that we could do. Okay, thank you very much. This is from Jack Markowski, City Club member who's with Community Investment Corporation. Jack, where are you? Back there off to my right. With an income-based approach to valuation, how will you determine the appropriate cap rates for various areas? Well, um, okay, so this is just a basic equation. So cap rate, again, this is a sort of fancy word for, um, there's an equation that when you value a property, you look at its net operating income, you divide it by its cap rate, and that gets you the value. So let's say you have a building net operating income of $1 million, and you have, uh, and that building sells for $10 million, then you can calculate the cap rate is 10%. What we do, right, what we are gonna be doing right now is we get our cap rates from third party data. So we look at CBRE, JLL, we use TREP, which is this terrific new database that not many assessors offices have used before where they scour the world's securities filings for appraisal documents that people give their lenders and uh, bond issuers. Um, to get you know to sit, get an understand of where the markets are, and we can look at prof pro uh, how properties are actually reporting their operating income to uh, bondholders to see what actual income and expense is for some buildings. Um, so we try to that's how we get our cap rates now. Um, that's imperfect, right? Uh, again, the example that I gave of Water Tower Place, if Water Tower Place's revenues are down by a third over the last five years. Um, looking at old lease rates is not going to be uh, a good metric for where they are today. And probably the old cap rates won't be good either. This is why the data bill is so important. The data bill will give us that net operating income so that whenever there are transactions out there in the market, we will know with more accurate data than any third party database is what the market is actually paying in terms of cap rates. And that is the way it should be done. Um, that's the way our peers do it in New York, in DC, in Virginia, in Boston. And I gotta tell you, I've, we visited the biggest institutional investors here in Chicago, and they say, you should emulate these places because it's predictable. We talked to the appraisal team of a big bank based here in Chicago, and they're saying, you know, Fritz, the problem is we have buildings that earn incomes on one street 
they have the similar incomes, but they're assessed in radically different ways because different analysts have looked at them and it's all over the place. And so when we have to lend against these things, we have to over escrow and cut the amount that we'll lend against them because we don't know where the assessment's gonna go. It's completely random. You should copy New York. <laughs> and I'm like, I wanna take you everywhere I go. Um, and so that's, that's, that is how we will get to those cap rates. You know, when the world's real estate investors, be they be local, or national or international, they value rental earning properties based on cap rates. And the data bill is really key to, to getting to that, where, where the market has that now. Uh, what, the last thing I wanted to mention for all the uh, real estate nerds out there is the way, we'll, the way the bill works is that we will not be assessing buildings based on that particular building's net operating income. We will take many buildings like it that are similar in an area and compile them together. And then we will use the average rent, the average expense ratio, uh, and average vacancy rate applying to those kinds of buildings in that neighborhood to assess them so that we're not revealing confidential information about those buildings, so that everyone is assessed fairly, and so that efficiency is incentivized. The person who fully occupies their building or runs at a lower uh, 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 expense ratio um, gets to have a lower effective rate than the person who has a higher occupancy rate and a higher expense ratio. Good, okay, we only have time for one or two more questions. I'll try to combine a couple of here. Uh, this is from Carolyn Craycraft, and also I Mitchell, went to, I'm- I went to school with uh, Elizabeth, her daughter. Really, well yeah. you're a lucky person, let me tell you that. And uh, this is for Mitchell. I'm sorry I can't read your last name. You better get a sharper pencil. <laughs> but you're with the Northwest Side Housing Center. Carolyn's question is, what's your position on tax breaks for wounded vets? And Mr. Mitchell's is, what will you do to lessen the property tax burden on senior citizens on low fixed incomes? Okay, so let me take the former question first on disabled vets. I spoke to a group of disabled veterans uh, just yesterday, um, and we talked about, there are two different kinds of uh, uh, veterans exemptions right now. First, for disabled vets. Um, if, if the VA certifies you at a certain level of disability, that qualifies you for the exemption. Um, and second of all, if you have a, have a, a disability level above 70%, you pay no, uh, you're exempted from property tax. Um, the key is that we want to make sure that it's not burdensome for veterans to recertify every year uh, their status. You know, we know in some cases you, you might recover your disability over time decreases. Uh, we want to see if there's a better way based on what we know about people's disabilities so that the person who lost uh, their limbs um, and uh, at Chosun Reservoir in Korea in the 50s doesn't have to continually recertify. Um, that they're still entitled to this disability. That seems like a real burden and quite ridiculous. So um, there are things that we can do on the data side to do that. There's another uh, returning vets exemption, um, which not many people qualify for, but uh, we, we want to make sure that everyone knows about the exemptions that they're entitled to. Um, this is a larger question. We think the office in the past has really been focused too much on spending its time on outreach, encouraging people to appeal their bad assessment at the expense of making people aware of the exemptions that they're all entitled to. Um, and we really want to make sure we're focused on the latter so that everyone knows about this. Um, then uh, uh, the seniors question, can you remind me what the seniors uh, want? Reducing the property taxes for low income seniors. Okay, um, so there are a couple of great benefits for seniors right now. First of all, there's a seniors exemption that anyone over 65 qualifies for. You have to recertify every year that you're still above 65. <laughs> Why? Why? It's, it's well, a big pain in the neck. Remember the movie Fletch, where yeah. he says, I, can you certify that you are still alive? That's, <laughs> that's kind of like what we have now. The excuse for why we ask people to do this now is that, um, uh, well, people die, and they're going to keep the senior exemption on their home. But uh, here in the 21st century, it is possible for the computer that knows uh, whether you died over the social security office or the clerk's office to talk to our computer so that we don't have to put hundreds of thousands of people through this burden every year. My dad, uh, you know. 
my, my mom died in April, okay? Um, Social Security, Medicare, the clerk's office, they knew um, within a month. It's kind of an outrage that we put hundreds of thousands of people through this every year. And, you know, last year, my dad, he was, he was burdened with, with this, and uh, he didn't apply for the seniors exemption last year because he was busy, you know, burying my mom. Why, why do we have to do this? So uh, there are 100, you know, about 100,000 people every year who forget to apply for that exemption wow. that everyone's entitled to. So we can do a lot better. We've talked, we've had really good conversations with leadership in the General Assembly to say that, hey, they're, technologically we're in a place that we don't have to worry about this. I think once we convince them of that in the bill, we can get that passed so that it can be automatically renewed. Okay, okay. Fritz, one last question. We just have a couple items of business, folks. When Constantine converted to Christianity in 325 AD, what effect did this have on the property tax assessment in the Roman Empire? <laughs> well, I have an answer for that, actually. I bet your dad does. <laughs> well, uh, I just I want to say something. So my dad, he was immersed in these very uh, uh, intricate historical details of Byzantium and Rome, but when he came home, he didn't teach us a thing about Byzantium. He only taught us two things that he was interested in, investing in politics. And Excellent. That rubbed off on me. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Walter.